religion is not great. He said, God is not great. And I have yet to, after several inquiries here tonight, get him to address that. And when I read his book and hear him talk, he makes a case against everything other than God. Maybe the name of the book should have been, God is not great. I don't think, or you have the right to think he's great if you just don't tell me. That might have been a more appropriate title. Uh, but I'm waiting for him to establish that God, not King James, not Muhammad, not Jerry Falwell, God is not great. So to ask me to defend who I have no personal relationship with, no belief in, is, is, is I'm in the wrong debate. I think that we can then agree that as long as I don't bother the sedate scholarly world of Mr. Hitchens, that I can believe in my God. And he's fine. And I'm fine with that because I'm certainly not trying to convert Mr. Hitchens. I'm just trying to have him understand that he cannot impose upon me how I relate to God by quoting things that I may or may not believe anywhere. I'm afraid we're not going to have any conversions tonight. Um, and I wasn't expecting any, although you never know if Christopher is going to start speaking in tongues before we're done. Uh, we, let's take some questions from the audience. There is... Is it working? Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the discussion. This question is for Mr. Hitchens. Uh, based on your prior writings, based on uh, most recently a timeout interview with you in which you claimed that the only time you ever prayed to God was for an erection. I'm going to ask you this question. Was that a miracle? <laughs> oh! Woo! Well, anyway, people... The question, Mr. Hitchens, is... Well, people... Um... Should... What people usually want to know was, uh, was the prayer answer. And Not me, baby. Uh, <laughs> the should we normal, sane Americans continue to be so bedazzled by a bespokes, off-cam superficialist who just wants the U.S. to pick up the many disastrous pieces of the British Empire and whose so understanding of God <laughs> is much shorter than his penis? <laughs> I didn't mind. Um, assuming that that um, was not a question, let's let's try another one. Well, no, I thought it was. It, it, it sounded interrogative. I mean, I don't want anyone to think I'm dodging anything. Is all. <laughs> yes. It might be difficult for me to follow up that one, but um. Correct me if I'm wrong, in the beginning of the talk, you, oh, um, we will, we will. <laughs> you expressed antipathy towards deism in principle. Slow down. I can't hear a word. I'm sorry. I can't either. Um, in, in the beginning of the talk, you express antipathy towards deism in principle, uh, predicated on this particular interpretation of God as a supreme dictator and judge. Is that correct? That would be correct, yes. Um, now, if I could play devil's advocate for God for a moment. Um, could you appreciate a God who watches us and our actions uh, eagerly and with great interest because he created a world where everything is permitted? Yes, I can, uh, I can picture it, but I'm not without horror. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Christopher. My name is Linda Ward Selby. I came from Toronto for this. This isn't um, about my penis, is it? No. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, in light of the number of intellectuals and well-educated people and Templeton Prize winners that oh, yeah. invoke the names of Richard Dawkins, you and others who are speaking out and liberating us right now, are they deluded, dishonest, or emotionally dysfunctional? And may I also ask, with regards to your book, you mentioned that at age nine that you realized that you might have been an atheist, but yet had two religious weddings, one uh, Greek Orthodox and then Jewish. Why did you do that? When my second wedding came along, I, I went for the 
um, justice of the peace in a real estate office uh, who, under a stuffed trout. <laughs> now, now I got the problem. Two failed marriages and one failed erection. You gave up on God. <laughs> you, you still don't, you still don't know. You still don't know how that prayer was answered, Reverend. That's, that's what you might call a premature ejaculation on your part. Uh, uh, the, and, Not if I had and, Mary to and, give me and, witness. And, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I only have one ex-wife and not even she in her most uh, adamant moments would describe our marriage as failed. I will say this, by the way. I hope to encourage anyone here who might be over in any difficulty. If you had a child with someone, you really could never be divorced from them. And uh, she and I are very proud of our children, and they are rather happy with us. It's a pity we couldn't get along better, but um, anyway, don't let me get too husky about this. Um, <laughs> on with the show, skipping lightly over the genitalia. <laughs> Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was a spiritualist, as far as we know. He seems to have believed in a number of weird and crackpotted theories. Joseph Priestley, the great Unitarian and rationalist and defender of the American Revolution, forced to flee from England to Philadelphia after the monarchists and Tories burned his laboratory, discoverer of oxygen, um, believed in the phlogiston theory, the most exploded theory that we know of. Uh, you'll find the coincidence or coexistence of uh, superstition and, and mania of all kinds with great scientific achievement um, all over the place. There may now be people who are real physicists. Fred Hoyle was actually one of them, the late Fred Hoyle, the man who believed in steady state and disbelieved what he contemptuously called the Big Bang, was also a man of odd, uh, intermittent faith. It doesn't matter. What you could not do is say that your evidence as a physicist or a biologist supported your private religious beliefs. It would be a coincidence. Whereas. If you are Richard Dawkins, the, the coherence between what you have found and what you've contributed to science and the extreme unlikelihood of the existence of any god is pretty striking. I hope that's clear. Please. Um, first of all, I have no interest in anyone's sex life. <laughs> Sorry. My question builds upon your response. Why do so many people seem to feel such a deep need to believe things which are obviously untrue? Homeopathy, angels, UFOs, you, you name it. All the claptrap which fills endless That's magazines, funny. television shows, etc. Did, did uh, as, as I understood the question, it was essentially why is, why is there such a uh, persistent need What's for faith, why do so many people continue to believe if Christopher argues that uh, the species has evolved beyond the need for it? Is that, is that your question? Well, not quite. What is the fundamental attraction of the illogical? Is what? Say it again. What is the fundamental attraction of the illogical? Oh, to, is it, is of it the an, illogical, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Is, is it, do people, uh, are people drawn to religion because they're drawn to superstition and things that aren't logical? Well, you first. <laughs> Let's go in reverse. <laughs> All right. Then, well, look, um, there's a poem by Philip Larkin called Church Going, which I hope anyone here who has not read, that sentence is going nowhere, I hope anyone who hasn't read that poem will, have, will let me do them a favor and look it up uh, for themselves before next, this time tomorrow, which would perfectly express my point of view. It's a, a wonderful statement by, by the greatest English poet of this period who, about the experience of visiting a church, not wanting to be able to believe, but not being able to dismiss the seriousness, the history, the tradition, the beauty of it. Um, I couldn't do without the poems of George Herbert or John Donne either, which are 